And good morning, everyone. Welcome to Education, Leadership, and Beyond, Surviving and Thriving. My name is Andrew Murata, and this is show number 21. And I'm super excited to have in studio, alongside me, is the middle school principal, Jean Fazino Lane, this week's guest on Education, Leadership, and Beyond. Jean will be up in our next segment, but she's been an educator her whole life, uh, helping kids, helping the communities uh, that she's worked in, and she is a fantastic lady. So excited to have Jean in the studio. It's show number 21, and we are on Country 107.7 WDLC, 106.9 WYNY, and Wall Radio. And on the FM stations, 941, 94.9, 105.7, 106.1, and 1340 on the AM. I was recently driving through Middletown, and I did click on through all those stations. It's also on 101.5 HD2, and on Sunday mornings, Pocono 96.7. Excited to be down there in the East Stroudsburg, Stroudsburg, Pocono area. So this is show number 21, and I'm in the studio. Gavin Burt's here. Gavin, you got a new haircut. Yes, I had uh, gotten tired of my old hair. It even though it had only grown out for a month, it was just getting on my nerves. And you, you went with the buzz cut. I did. Uh, that's not to say I'll get this in the future, but it just felt good at the moment. And this is how I wore my hair 20 years ago. I remember the first time I cut my hair this way. My mother was ready to disown me at age 15. So. Uh-huh. Well, it's looking good. You got the Thank headset you. going. You're looking aerodynamic. Thank you. Normally, that's a spring haircut, but as we're approaching uh, winter, I like it. Well, thank you. And uh, when, when I was actually bald, I used to shave my head. My nickname around the office was Alien Baby. Because uh-huh. I look like an alien baby. That so. goes in line with the UFO and the uh, yeah. supernatural books you like. Absolutely. <laughs> Gavin Bird, everyone. And Gavin, always appreciate what you do for me here in the studio. So let's get started. Uh, this week's concept on education, leadership, and beyond. We have a great leader with us as our guest, Jean Lane. She'll be up in the, the next segment. And I wanted to talk about uh, some characteristics of, of leaders. One of the things at school that I talk about, uh, school, I I describe sometimes like a wedding. Well, how the heck can school be like a wedding? Well, think about it. When was the last wedding you went to? I love weddings. I come from a big Italian family, and normally we have the, you know, a big DJ, a big dance floor. Everyone's out there, and I love those, uh, the weddings. But think about all the things that go into a wedding. You have the cake, you have the hall, you have the church, you have the limos, you have the wedding party, you have the food, the air conditioning, the band or DJ, uh, the reception, the cocktail hour, the honeymoon, the invitations, the thank you, the breakfast, all of that stuff and, and all of the things that go into that, there's so many moving parts. And sometimes I say in school, You know, what's the most important part of the wedding? You know, sometimes people lose that, but it's really the love of the couple. And if you don't have the love of the couple, all of those things will don't mean anything. But if you're in charge and the air conditioner is not working or there's no knife to cut the cake, you know, there's going to be an issue. So as the leader, you have all of those things to focus on. And those are specific things. Today's concept, I want to talk about some basic values in leadership. They have nothing to do with talent or skill, and they're not even academically focused. As educators, we have a lot of things, again, in, in compared to that wedding, that we have to do academically to make sure uh, there is an academic rigor for our students. But today's concept are basic values in leadership. I got this from my friend Dan Spanauer, who puts out the Coaching and Leadership Journal every month down in Winston-Salem. If you're interested, you could Google that, the Coaching and Leadership Journal. We've spoke about Dan on the show before, and we've got him coming up in 2018. And he adapted this from smartbrief.com. So if you're at home on Saturday or Sunday morning, jot these down. We're going to start with positive assumptions and having a positive outlook. There are five of them, and again, these are basic values in leadership. Are you someone that looks at the situation that's in front of you, and like the old-fashioned saying, is the glass half full? There are people out there that no matter what the circumstances are, 
They're looking for solutions. They're maintaining a positive attitude. And they have positive assumptions about the people they work with. No matter what it is or the issue, it's going to work out. It's going to be okay. So as a leader, have positive assumptions. Number two, have trust. Have trust in those you work with and have authenticity. You be authentic and and those around you, you be trustful of them. In the absence of trust, my old friend, uh, our former superintendent in Port Jervis used to use the acronym FEAR. And how, how does that relate to trust? Well, when there's a lack of trust, there's fear and false evidence appears real. That's the acronym for fear. False evidence appears real. So when there's a lack of trust, something might happen and you right away, aha, that happened because da 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 da, because in your mind you're thinking that that person, uh, that there's a lack of trust. So if you're a leader, work with trust and, and take people at their word. If they're not being honest and truthful and you have proof of that, you certainly have to address that. And most times I do that with the kids at school. Uh, rarely I have to do it with the adults. But hey, things happen, you know. The third thing, the third basic value in leadership, inclusion. Are you someone who brings people on board? Are you a multiplier? Are you someone that people want to gravitate towards? Again, my guest in today's show is the middle school principal here in Port Jervis, school's Jean Fazino Lane. She is someone that definitely does that. She brings the kids in. She brings her staff in. Inclusion breeds commitment, and commitment breeds success. When you feel included in a group, when you feel part of a team, You are going to work harder and be committed to that team, which is going to make more uh, success in your team. Bringing people together allows for shared decision making. That's another trait that I've seen in in my colleague, uh, Gene Fazzino Lane, bringing people together and asking their opinion. At the end of the day, the leader, you might not take their opinion. But you've heard it, you've, you've put it you know, in, in a process in your mind, uh, and it might not fit in that situation, but at least people uh, feel part of what's happening. So be inclusive of people. Next, you have to challenge people. You have to ask people to rise up. We work in a situation where we have unions and there's specific roles and specific um, job guidelines. But that doesn't mean people can't step outside of that. That doesn't mean people that work at a high level can do more. Uh, One of Dr. Gilbert's great sayings that I've adopted is do more than expected. Well, as the leader, if you're not challenging people, how many people are going to do more than expected? So you should always be providing an opportunity for growth, providing uh, different avenues for people to rise above and do more. And have a growth mindset. Uh, We talked about on the show a fixed mindset versus a growth mindset and and what that can do for you. So as as a leader, you want to have people around you that have a growth mindset. Where are you and where can they help take you? Lastly is recognition. We work with a lot of people in the schools and we work with a lot of students. And people like to be recognized no matter what their role, whether they are um, a teacher assistant, whether they're uh, someone that just has a a part-time duty in the school, or they're the superintendent. People want to pat on the back. There's no bonuses in the the world of education. Sometimes out in the real world, we say, you know, there's bonuses. There's people achieve a certain level and they might make more money. Well, we don't have that, but we do have recognition. And recently in our district, Uh, In our elementary school last year, Nicole I uh, was the assistant principal of the year uh, for our school administrators association in New York State. She won that award. She was nominated by our colleagues. In 2014, Heidi Nyland uh, won assistant principal of the year as well, my partner at the high school. And two years ago, we had Carolyn Doherty came in runner up for teacher of the year. Man, what a fantastic uh, thing that was for our school. Out of all of New York State, she was runner-up. How they didn't pick her, I don't know. But, man, it was great for us, our team at the high school, our district, to go through that process. And certainly I know um, Carolyn felt good about it. And uh, we were all a little disappointed she didn't win. But, hey, 
We shot for the uh, the moon, and we landed amongst the stars. We had the runner-up in the Teacher of the Year uh, competition. Just two weeks ago, I had my secretary and our nurse. They won the uh, awards for Mid-Hudson Study Council uh, in Orange County, and that was a great night to celebrate our people. So as a leader, are you recognizing people you work with? Are you letting them know they do a good job? It doesn't cost you anything to... Uh, Jean Lane's having a heart attack over here. I, I don't know. We might have to recognize her as the... <laughs> she, oh, <laughs> Jean, are you okay? Well, I, I have a couple... Of, you know, We're almost done with my segment. We're bringing you on. I can't have you rush to the hospital before that happens. You would be our first guest that we would have to get a sub. And you are irreplaceable, so I don't know what we would do. She'll be there <laughs> ready for her next segment. So what I was saying is recognize your people, pat them on the back, and uh, uh, that is something that you could do. So to summarize, to go back, some basic values in leadership, again, taken from the Coaching and Leadership Journal from my friend Dan Spanauer. Work with positive assumptions and a positive outlook. Have trust with those you work with. Be inclusive of others. Include them in the decision-making process. That doesn't mean they get to make the decision, but they're part of it. Number four, you have to challenge your people and provide an opportunity for growth. And number five, you have to recognize a job well done. You also have to recognize maybe if they're falling short and address that, but in a positive sense, recognize those that do a good job. We are going to take a break here on Education, Leadership, and Beyond, Surviving and Thriving on WDLC, WYNY, and Wall Radio, and Pocono 96.7. We'll be right back on Education, Leadership, and Beyond. And welcome back, everyone, to Education, Leadership, and Beyond, Surviving and Thriving. This is show number 21, and we are on WDLC, WYNY, Wall Radio, and Pocono 96.7. I am excited that my friend Gene Lane, Gene Fazino Lane, uh, the principal of the middle school here in Port Jervis, is my guest today. Good morning, Gene. Thanks for being on. Thank you, Andrew. It's so great to be here. I'm glad you made it through your coughing fit. I did, you yes. Know, we have water here. We have some Ricola mints for you. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Everything taken care of. Great. Principal Lane, it's an honor to have you here. Gene, I, I worked at a middle school uh, for just a couple of years before I moved up to, to Orange County area. Tell our listening audience, what is it like to work in a middle school in 2017? Um, I'm laughing because uh, that, you have to keep a sense of humor. It's the best place in the world. I mean, if you can imagine 400 7th and 8th graders running around and all the positive and negatives that that involves. It's just, um, it's a thrill a minute. That's what I like to say. Jean, they, you know, you hear it all over that in the middle school years, it's, it's a tricky for development and student development. What would you say uh, to that point? And what would you say is the is the hardest part of the student development for those years? It's absolutely a hard time for the students. They are at a point in their lives where they are trying to figure out their identity, and they have a lot of choices in front of them, and uh, they start you know, being mom and dad or grandma and grandpa's little guy. And now they're in the middle school and people are looking ahead and saying, well, who who are you really? Who are you going to be? Are you going to be the athlete? Are you going to be the scholar? Are you going to be the kid that's the class clown? Or can you be somebody different? And what is your potential? And all of that is very hard for a child. I mean, when you look at some adults, we haven't figured out yet who we're going to be, but we're expecting these little guys, these 12 and 13 year olds to know who they are. And it's just a time of great growth and great learning for them. And all the possibilities are open. Gene, we here at Port Jervis, one of the things that I think sets us apart from other schools is our personal connections to our community, our kids. You know so many of the kids, even at the high school. Today, you said, hey, man, I got the high school kids here at the, at the school. Uh, you only have them for 7th and 8th grade. A lot of the, the standard middle schools are 6th, 7th, and 8th grade. 
Is there any pod- positives to that setup of 7th and 8th? And or how, how does that work that it's only 7th and 8th grade? Well, it's difficult as far as um, getting all the academics in because you're right to say many middle schools are 5, 6, 7, and 8 or seven, uh, 6, 7, and 8. Definitely very few are only 7 and 8. So we have to account for putting a lot of the academics in in two years. Um, I just, when people ask me about 7th and 8th grade, I just think of those parents that come for our 7th grade orientation. And I'm looking at them and I'm literally taking their 6th grade babies and I'm making them into high schoolers and when you think of that that's kind of awe inspiring um, that they're trusting us with that amount of development and the sixth graders the seventh graders when they first come in they have no idea what a middle school is like or what the expectation is and it's very different elementary school is a kind of a nice safe closed environment they have the same teacher all the time so now they're changing classes they're doing lunch by themselves, they're doing everything on their own. And we have to balance that between wanting them to feel comfortable where they are, but really do it quickly because the next year you're going upstairs, we always call it upstairs to the third floor, and then to the big house. So um, yeah, it's a lot of stuff to put on kids in two years and to put on their parents. Sure. And I know one of the things you do a great job is calming those fears and working with the parents. Gene, one of the things, I mean, I hear about it at my level as a high school level, but I think the biggest level that we hear about it, uh, parents have so many concerns about bullying, and it's such a topic. Um, it's been sad. We've seen it in the news that kids take their own lives because they, they feel bullied. How do you address bullying in the school? And Is it always bullying? Is it always? We're so quick to point it out. So what are your thoughts on bullying and and how do you address that in the school? So we have to be very careful about it because um, it is so serious. Of course, you know, we want to say, oh, don't worry about it or it's just kids being kids or whatever. But the other side of it is students do take their own lives and we have to take a look at everything that's involved in it. How are they treating each other? Social media is crazy. There's many times on a Monday morning that um, the kids come in and we have to deal with the repercussions of what's been going on on Snapchat and Facebook and stuff all weekend. So we have to be very straightforward about it very honest about it and very like willing to look at all aspects of it and very protective of the kids. If a kid comes to me and feels like he or she is being threatened, I need to take that very seriously. On the other hand, I also need to say, well, sometimes kids are kids and we need to have the conversations with each other. I think the open communication between the kids, between each other, the parents and the kids, the parents and the other adults in my building, that all makes it work. So we are taking care of the child because each child is different. Some child is more sensitive than another and needs to be treated differently. But we need to look at every single aspect of it, which takes a long time, a real long time. Sure. Gavin, I saw you wanted to jump in here. What do you got, Gav? I have a comment and a question. One, I liked, and I'm referring to my time in school many years ago, not to anyone locally, but I like your use of the phrase big house. For me, middle (laughs) school and high school were both the big houses in jail. (laughs) That leads to my question. I was in middle school and high school from 1991 to 1998, and that was a very different time. Almost nobody had a cell phone. Facebook hadn't been born yet. The internet was in its infancy. By the time I hit high school, it didn't exist when I was in middle school. And I will admit that I was bullied back in the day. But back then, you know, you went home and you were safe. I think we got one prank call over the years. But when you went home, the bullying stopped. Here's my question. How much of an impact on bullying in the year 2017 do you think is related to social media? And also, do you ever feel that a lot of it is caused by young people not having enough instinct? I mean, obviously, there are things you don't put online. You've got to be careful who you talk to online. Uh, there's a lot of bad stuff out there. So my questions are, how much is technology today causing bullying, like you're saying? And two, how much of it is, you th- do you think kids just uh, being kids and not knowing better? So those are really good questions. And I would love to blame it all on the Internet. But unfortunately, it's a lot of both. So, yes, the social media has a 
big dramatic impact on our students. So I'd like to put a plug in for one thing that we do do at Port, which is very different than many schools. In the middle school, we don't allow the students to have cell phones at all. And we tell them that from the very beginning. As soon as they walk in the door, the cell phones go in their lockers. If parents need to contact them, that's a legitimate thing. They call the office because we want the adults to be the buffer in between the students and their cell phones. And that eliminates a lot of problems. So we take that out and we focus on ultimately all the time teaching, teaching, teaching teaching kids to use the cell phones. They're part of their lives. They're just because we don't let them have them during the day doesn't mean they're, they have it all the time. So we bring people in and talk all the time about what's appropriate use. What, um, what impact does it have, not even just between me and you or you and somebody else, but your future? Like, what is this going to this is going to be around for a long time. You have to be careful about what you say. And also, this isn't going to identify you. Let's fix it if you've done something stupid online. There is a way to deal with it, and we can deal with it in a lot of different ways. I love the fact that in Port Jervis, so many members of the community come to help. Like, we have so many people that will say, my group offers to come and do this little workshop. So we have the police department coming in. We have really open communication with PJPD. They tell us what's going on and we tell them and we we are able to stop a lot of the problems that go on over the weekend or that spill into the school or vice versa. But it's just about being aware of everything and just making sure that you never take that time to say, oh my gosh, this is just too hard for me to deal with it. And it'll go away if I ignore it. You can't ignore anything in the middle school. Everything is in your face. Great answer, <laughs> uh, Principal Lane. Great answer. What would you tell parents? Do, do parents ask you, well, you know, should my kid have a phone? What age should should the kid have the phone? Do you get that question? From no, parents? I never get that question. But I get applause when I tell the parents at seventh grade orientation that we don't allow the cell phone in the building. And some parents will say, but, you know, what if I need to, again, if there's a family emergency, I want to contact my kid. That's great. Then you call the nurse or you call the main office and we will get them. It just takes away so many more problems than is worth. But nobody ever asks me anymore because to Truthfully, by seventh grade, everybody has a phone already. <laughs> <laughs> Principal Lane, you are the face of the school. The kids identify with you, and your staff identifies with you. How do you motivate your staff uh, and, and you know your style with the staff? Tell me about working with the teachers in the middle school. So if anybody knows Port Jervis Middle School, they know that this is these are 40 of the most amazing people I have ever worked with. They are so professional, so dedicated. So I love the part about Port Jervis, again, the community. So many of our teachers went through Port Jervis, left, went away to college, and now came back and are raising their kids. There's no more solid foundation than that in a building. You know, they know the, the teachers know the community. They know the kids. They know the kids' parents. They went to school with the kids' parents. We just are all in this together. And the teachers are stretched. You know, state ed doesn't care that we're at Port Jervis. State, state ed cares about what our scores are. And a couple of years ago, we were designated a focus school, which means that our students weren't making the progress that the state decided was we should be. And for the last three years, we've been doing so much professional learning with the um, faculty and really focusing on what's going on in the classroom. And the teachers have done everything they have been asked to do. Um, they have gone to all the meetings. They have looked at each other. They have looked at themselves. They have looked at the kids. They have figured out what exactly we're going to do to make this better. And I just can't say enough about this faculty. Um, the kids, even, when we uh, talk to the kids about the faculty, they're like, they're always in my face. We're like, yep, that's exactly where they belong, right there. There's not anything that gets past all of us as a team. That's a great uh, sense of teamwork and community in that school. So, Gene, we are up against a break here on Education, Leadership, and Beyond. We will be right back with everyone with middle school principal in Port Jervis, Gene Fazino Lane, here on Education, Leadership, and Beyond, Surviving and Thriving. And welcome back, everyone, to Education, Leadership, and Beyond, Surviving and Thriving. 
here on WDLC, WYNY, Wall Radio, and Pocono 96.7. My guest today on Education, Leadership, and Beyond is middle school principal and educator extraordinaire, Jean Fazino Lane. Jean, it is an honor to have you on. Jean, you've worked at so many different levels of education. You were an elementary teacher. You were a technology specialist. You were the principal at an alternative program in Port Jervis when it just started. You were uh, the assistant superintendent in Beacon. You know, working at all those levels, what did that do for your, your role now as principal? And if you could only have picked one, you could only be at one level, which level would it be? Wow. So I have to say... And people laugh at me all the time, but... Because well, you're funny. We're not Port laughing at you. We're <laughs> laughing with you. But Port Jervis Middle School is the place is the place to be. And it's not because I'm there now, because when I wasn't there, I was pining for it. And in Beacon, I ha- we had a couple of Port people in Beacon, and they would, whenever we would talk about Port, the Beacon people would roll their eyes <laughs> and say, yeah, we know about Port. So uh, Port Jervis Middle School is great, and that is absolutely the place I love. So the good part about Port Jervis Middle School is that there's 400 kids there. Um, being a um, assistant superintendent was interesting because um, the challenges of being so in charge of every, the instruction and the curriculum for a whole district is an awesome job. But I really miss the kids. And there was times when people in central office or whatever you want to call it in your district, you're sitting there, I was sitting there, and I was saying, this could be the Bank of America. This has nothing to do with education because there's so many rules and regulations and the stuff that you have to do that... Um, you kind of could forget about it. But when you're in a middle school and when you're, you have kids in front of you, the teachers, that's the most important job in the world. And when you have the kids, they keep you grounded and sane and really focused because that's the only reason we're here. Yeah. Jean, someone out there listening, they might have their checkbook out right now. <laughs> and if they do, what if someone wrote you a check for a million dollars and you had to use it for kids in the middle school? It couldn't be on like new windows or, uh, you know, new lockers. It had to be something directly for kids. If you got that check in the mail, and if you're listening and you got that checkbook out, (laughs) send it to us. But what would you do, Jean? Well, that's interesting because as soon as you said a million dollars, I was thinking, great, we need a new building. (laughs) Our building is the oldest building in Port Jervis, but it's the best. And I love it because it's the only one that's in the city of Port Jervis. Sure. So it is a great building. But, um, wow, a million dollars for the kids. So first we would get all the technology we need because we've been waiting for state ed to come through on that kind of stuff. Um, the kids need to get ready. As much as I am I have them lock their cell phones up, they need the technology to get to the next level in their education. And hopefully At, that's coming with the smart bond? Yes, right? yeah? yes. Okay. We are very hopeful about that and very positive about that. And we can always use more teachers because they're the ones that are on the front lines and they want to do all different things with the kids and just fitting more minutes in the day, but I don't think a million dollars will fix that either. We, we, we'll, <laughs> we'll buy some time with that. <laughs> Ms. Lane, I want to shift gears a little bit um, and ask you some questions about your personal life. You know, uh, before we get to your, well, let's go right to your family. I want to ask you about your Yukon, but let's let's go right to your family. You have a, a wonderful family, your husband, Lou, uh, and you got the bi- a big group here, Eric, Ian, Sonia, and Jim, tell me the story. One of those children is is adopted, right? Yeah. And tell us that story. <laughs> so Jim is uh, our adopted son. He's been living with us since 1999, which is kind of awesome. Uh, he and Eric were friends in high school. They both were on the track team at Minnesink. And um, Jim was having a rough time with his parents, so he kind of started spending a lot of time on our couch I didn't exactly know what this person was doing there, but kind of trusted Eric and Ian and Sonia to say, yeah, it's okay. He's not in trouble, but, you know, he needs some time. And it ended up he um, he did come to live with us. He went away to school. He actually went to West Point, graduated from there, had a successful career in the military, and is now 
and went on to have his business degree. So he's just one of the great kids that are in my family now. Fantastic. Been there forever. Yeah. It's a great story. Yeah. And you just had a wedding uh, overseas, correct? We did. Tell us about Eric the wedding. Eric got married in Scotland for no apparent reason wow. except that it was awesome. And so we had a wedding in Edinburgh Castle. Wow. Which was crazy. And I never travel anywhere. So this was so fun for me. Just hopped on a plane in Newburgh and landed in Scotland. That's fantastic. It was crazy. Yeah. <laughs> And now you're part of the Cool Club. Uh, I think that's what you and Miss Benedict called it. You have the, your beautiful grandkids. Caleb is five, Clara is two, and Ruby is one. To, you know, what, what's it like to be a grandmother? Uh, wow. You know? It's the best because uh, you don't have to discipline them. You give them anything they want, and they love you unconditionally because you're so much better than mom and papa. <laughs> and it's just the best. The only hard part is, is that um, Caleb and Clara are in New Hampshire. Hampshire and Ruby's in Charlottesville. So I would like to see them more, but we make the best of our time together. You got to travel north and south. Yes. And, uh, okay. Well, that is great. And I'm sure they're listening and tuning in and <laughs> listening to, to Grandma. Uh, Gene, we've had a lot of different leaders on the show. We've had superintendents and, and lawyers. And last week, John Feinstein, the author, was on. He did a great yeah. job. I know one of the people uh, that you admire um, is, is Coach Oriema from, <laughs> from uh, uh, UConn Women's Basketball. And you're such a big UConn fan. How did you become a UConn women's basketball fan, and uh, how did that start? It's so ingrained in me. I grew up in Connecticut, okay. so pretty much, you know, we don't have any professional teams there, so it was yeah, always... You, yeah, you do. UConn uh, women's basketball. Yeah, well, yeah, they're the closest <laughs> that you get. So I was away at college by the time that coach came, and no, we actually passed college, I think. I'm giving you little hints of my age here. And I would call home and talk to my aunt or... Um, cousins, and nobody would talk to me if the UConn girls were on TV. I'd be like, what's going on with this guy? So actually, Coach Ariema comes from the same small village in Italy by Naples, Avignon, that uh, my family's from. So if he's listening, we're connected, Coach. He's your paisan. He's my paisan. I love it. And, uh, oh, man, I just love watching those girls. They're, they're just so amazing, so amazing. And tell us, what, what leadership attributes of Coach Oriyama do you respect the most? I love that he's so tough and he never lets people off the hook, but also that the people admire him for that and understand that his reason for doing that is not because he's you know wants to be a jerk or the worst best coach or whatever it's all about them he's trying to get them to be the best that they can be and when you think of you know Maya Moore and and Stewie and uh, Diana Taurasi best women basketball players ever when they talk about Gino it was it's this like kind of amazement that he got this out of me you know, he challenged me. And also CD, his assistant coach, Okay, got the best. That's fantastic. Gene, I have, uh, before, uh, we have a little more time here. Um, so before I get to my last question, I have some rapid fire questions. Uh -oh. These are a quick answer. Um, you know, the first thing that comes to mind. So what is the best thing about Port Jervis Middle School? <laughs> Everything. Give me your top three. <laughs> top three, kids, uh, staff, and building. You're throwing <laughs> the building in there. We're working yep. on getting that new building. The best thing about uh, being an educator in 2017? I think that it's always, in education, it's always about the possibilities. The possibilities are endless. You have all these students in front of you. Their lives are ahead of them. And, you know, the world is all there. We talked about uh, the basic qualities of a leader, uh, basic values of a leader in our opening segment. What, in your opinion, what is the most important quality of a leader? I guess it's the perseverance, is to believe in yourself and, and your team so much that you never give up. You just keep going. Besides me, what is something <laughs> that gets under your skin? <laughs> <laughs> it is you a lot, Andrew. <laughs> um, I, I, I don't know. Not very much. I think like just mean people or, you know, when the kids are, are mean to each other and I can't figure out how to get them past that. Yeah. That's yeah. And one of the reasons I wanted to have you on, besides you being my colleague, you have such a big heart. You love the kids. You love, you know, you're full of passion. I love it. Um, how do you deal with stress? If you can believe this, I meditate. 
Yeah, people right. can't picture me doing that, but I like, do. Like home yeah. meditating? Yeah, in the morning and in the night. Yep. Wow. Been doing it a long time. So imagine how wild I'd be if I didn't meditate. I can't tell you <laughs> uh, my chant on the air of what I meditate, but I meditate too. <laughs> yeah. I can't tell you that. Last movie you watched. Okay, you are going to laugh at this. I, I was trying to think, what if somebody asked me what's left? I actually don't watch movies, but... I've been re-watching the HBO special March to Madness uh-huh. because it's yeah. going to be basketball season That's soon. Right. So That's right. i got to watch my girls. November 10th. <laughs> Last book you read? I'm reading now Outlander. Oh, in regards to... So it's it's like because of Scotland and I just feel like I'm there. It's great. The thing that motivates you? I think I have hope and faith in pretty much everything. I believe that in the good. That opening segment, again, the, uh, you know, having positive assumptions. Yeah. And having, yeah, you are a master I assume of that. that everything's going to work out. In your opinion, what's the best way that students can learn? They have to believe that the teachers love them and that we're doing it for the best reasons for them. It's not, if they, um, if they trust us, we can take them miles away. What's a question that I uh, did not ask you that I should have? Wow, that's tough. I don't know. I think you pretty much covered it, Andrew. We're trying to get uh, it all out of you, Gene. You, <laughs> you might be small in stature, but you bring a lot to the table. You know what I mean? Okay. Well, we uh, are going to come back with our last segment, uh, Principal Lane, and our last segment is a write-in portion. We do have a question for you. So um, this is Education, Leadership, and Beyond, Surviving and Thriving, with my guest, middle school principal Gene Fazzino Lane, on WDLC, WYNY, Wall Radio, and Pocono 96.7. We'll be right back. And welcome back, everyone, to Education, Leadership, and Beyond, Surviving and Thriving. My name is Andrew Murata, and this was show number 21 with my guest, Gene Fazzino Lane. Before we get back to Principal Lane, want to recap today's show. We talked about Uh, Some basic values in leadership. I got these from my friend Dan Spanauer, the Coaching and Leadership Journal. You can Google that. Um, And we talked about positive assumptions, having a positive outlook. As a leader, these are some things uh, that you can tuck in your toolbox and use each and every day. They have nothing to do with skill uh, or uh, a talent. They have to do with you and your mindset. So number one, having a positive assumption and positive outlook. Number two, trust. Show trust, demonstrate trust, and show authenticity in your work. Number three, be inclusive of people. My guest today, Principal Gene Lane, talked about that, bringing people together. Number four, challenging people, providing an opportunity for them to grow and uh, having a growth mindset yourself to be the example for them. And number five, recognizing people that you work with, uh, their achievements, and and honoring them and giving that well-deserved pat on the back. This is uh, the write-in portion of the show. You certainly can write in uh, a question on the show. You can shoot it to Twitter, uh, Twitter, at Andrew Murata 21 You can also email in the show, Andrew at NeverSinkMediaGroup.com. And also on my website, you can contact me, AndrewMurata.com. Also on my website is my book that was released in September. I just gave Principal Lane her copy. It's called The Principal, Surviving and Thriving. And certainly as a leader, we go back and forth through that surviving and thriving. And uh, the book is getting great reviews. If you're interested, uh, you can get it at andrewmarada.com or certainly email in andrew at neversinkmediagroup.com. That being said, I welcome back in Principal Lane. And uh, Miss Lane, we do have a question <coughs> in for you today. And the question is, what advice would you give to parents of fifth and sixth grade students to best prepare them for middle school? Well, that's a good one. That is that is a question I do hear um, at seventh grade orientation. Um, I think that it's it's a balancing act between not getting them so nervous about middle school that they're, you know, terrified of it and, and can't just enjoy being there. But also they need to step up in middle school. It, it is the time where they have to take responsibility for their actions 
And um, I think that, oh, that that would be it. It would be, um, well, let's take responsibility for our actions, the positive and the negative. And at the negative one, take it as a lesson. So I always say with um, when the seventh graders come in, there's always somebody that I'll um, catch doing something or I'll, I'll be asking them, well, so what happened here? And they're kind of saying, oh, I didn't do anything. It, that is the lesson that everybody in the middle school learns is that it's okay to make mistakes. We're in it together and let's just get past it. So when um, someone comes up and says, okay, I did this. I'm like, okay, cool. That's all we need to know. Let's figure out why you did it and how you can make it better. And then it's over with. Uh, the next day, if that child, if I see that child in the hall, I'm not going to be, you know, oh, I remember you did this bad thing. It's going to be, so how are you doing today? What's good? And we're, we're on to the next thing. So I think um, them taking responsibility for their actions, but also for their learning. And that goes back to the, uh, what we've been learning as teachers these last couple of years, but really focusing on this year. The teachers, as I said before, do a lot of are, are the hardest working people in that building. But now we have to get the students to take responsibility for their learning as well. And we're working on a shift so that, uh, you know, the teachers aren't doing all the work, but the students are. And again, with the thought in mind that they're the, the class of 20, whatever they are. We tell them that in seventh grade. I think it's 2023. Oh, my God. That seems yeah, so far yeah. in the future. But like, as soon as they, because we want them to take, to, to be the team together, you know, like these are the kids you're going to be with freshman, sophomore. They don't even know what those years are called in high school. Sure. And, you know, like let's, we're going to succeed together. Gene, that's great what you were saying about taking responsibility and, and taking the fear out of it. Uh, we use a very similar motto at the high school. Admit it. Fix it and move on. Mm -hmm. Kids are going to do things. We can't ignore them, but you have to address it. But it's not the end of the world, right. and that's a, a great mentality. Gene, I have one more question. Uh, one of the things we say to the high schoolers, uh, you know, we say little kids, little problems, big kids, big problems. Sometimes at your level, it's little kids, big problems. We've had uh, pregnancy uh, at the middle school. We had some uh, some very heavy duty learning experiences last year with with racial. Um, some of the things that were going on around the country were mirroring themselves in our schools. How do you how do you address some of these issues that are really for 17, 18, 19? They're older kids, the big kids. But you have them in, you know, in the small, small spots, but you have them with little kids. They're 12 and 13 years old. How do you, how do you handle that? That was a really hard um, situation for us last year. As you said, it was mirroring what was going on in society in America, um, still is. Uh, but, so we had to face it, but face it in a way that the students could get a handle on it and put it in their terms and grow from it and not have it overwhelm them. And that was a really difficult thing. Of course, none of us had ever done that before. So it was, I feel, communicating, 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 talking to the parents, talking to the kids, talking to whoever we needed to speak with, people coming in to help us, um, great people from the YMCA, breaking the cycle, um, the police department. It's just knowing that we are a community, and sometimes we're, uh, the worst of us is showing, and sometimes the best of us is showing, but we're all in this together, and we will struggle through it, and we know at the end of the day we're going to come out better for it. It's like our families, right? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely, like our families. Gene, you're a fantastic leader. I'm so happy that you came on. Uh, it was great. This is Principal Lane, everyone, from Port Jervis Middle Schools, a lifelong educator, a great teacher. And uh, if you know her, you love her. And hopefully if you don't know her and you listen to the program, uh, certainly shoot her a note at the middle school or, or send me some feedback, andrew at com. But it's people like Gene Lane that are out there uh, educating our kids, working with our staff, and making the world a better place. So, Gene, I thank you for coming on. Next week's guest is John Clockerty. John Clockerty is not a, a local person. He was my former supervisor in the ACC for officiating. He's done 12 Final Fours. 
Gene oh. talked about UConn <laughs> women. Well, uh, John was on the men's side. Uh, he's a fantastic leader. Uh, and again, he was the boss of the ACC for 10 plus years. Uh, uh, and he'll be our guest next week. So that is all for Education, Leadership, and Beyond, Surviving and Thriving. Again, this was Andrew Murata, show number 21. Thank you so much for tuning in. Go out and make the world a better place. Have a great day, everyone.